In 1982, brothers Chris and Tim Stamper founded game development and publishing company Ultimate Play the Game. Ultimate would go on to release many hit games during the 8-bit bedroom coding era in the UK. Titles such as Saberwolf, Attic Attack, Jetpack, but perhaps their most technically impressive release and the one that really made Ultimate stand out as a premier software development house in Europe was Nightlaw. Utilizing an isometric view, the Stamper Brothers built an engine for the game known as Filmation. For the time, this was an incredible piece of programming, allowing the main character to move in completely isometric worlds, interact with objects, and the engine would handle things like drawing priorities perfectly. This was all running on a 3.5 MHz Sinclair ZX Spectrum. And while not the first ever isometric game, Nightlaw set the benchmark and soon other games would utilize the isometric view to great effect. Ultimate Play the Game were the masters of the Sinclair ZX Spectrum in the early days. But by 1985, the Stamper Brothers had sold the company to UK publishing giant US Gold, which fumbled with the label and the releases weren't up to the level of excellence of the golden years of the company. By 1988, another company, Rare Limited, founded by the Stamper Brothers, would buy back all the rights sold to US Gold and rebrand the company to be known as just Rare. The ultimate name was gone, but Rare would soon become a household name in the United States and the rest of the world, working on games for the NES, Super NES and Nintendo 64. Classic games such as Battletoads, Donkey Kong Country, Killer Instinct, Banjo-Kazooie and much more. In 2002, frustrated that Nintendo was not providing Rare with the capital or acquiring a percentage in the company, Rare shopped around for a buyer and in the end Microsoft purchased the company for $375 million and many, but not all character trademarks, had now belonged to Microsoft. Rare under Microsoft continued to release games with both new IPs and releasing older games under the Xbox Live Arcade brand and in 2015 Rare Replay was released. So back in 2015, Rare and Microsoft released Rare Replay, which was a collection of 30 games over 30 years of history by Rare and Ultimate Play the Game, the original company that was made up of the Stamper Brothers, all the way up to the modern era of games like Viva Pinata and Banjo-Kazooie. But what if I told you guys that Rare Replay was not the first time that Rare had dabbled with putting games from past eras onto a collection and incorporated it onto physical media. In 1997, Rare released GoldenEye 007 for the Nintendo 64 and to this day is still considered one of the greatest games ever made developed by just a small team of inexperienced at the time developers and learning about the Nintendo 64 along the way, GoldenEye would be a thrilling and addictive movie tie-in game that let's face it, that genre didn't have a great track record of good games to begin with and coupled with 20 unique levels of compelling gameplay and just the right difficulty would also include hidden missions, custom game modes, and the four-player multiplayer. Stealth was another element of the gameplay, with weapons that had suppressors, throwing knives, and weapons that had different characteristics, such as rate of fire, different types of bullet penetration, and ammunition. Localized body damage was also a feature, but the game would never take itself too seriously, with some funny British humor. GoldenEye would soon set the standard for first-person shooters on consoles with addictive and fun multiplayer, and the game would become a smash hit on the Nintendo 64 as the third best-selling game on the system. But GoldenEye would also contain secrets that would take years to discover. One of the programmers, Steve Ellis, would write a Sinclair ZX Spectrum emulator to run on the Nintendo 64 hardware to see what the hardware was capable of doing. This emulator started life as a side experiment, but at some point during the development of GoldenEye, it was added to the GoldenEye game code, possibly as a hidden unlockable or via some other means. The emulator would also contain 10 games that were released on the ZX Spectrum by Ultimate Play the Game, including hits such as Attic Attack, Saberwolf and Nightlaw, as well as seven others. While not the entire Ultimate Play the Game ZX Spectrum collection, it was a large chunk of their games. Rumor has it before GoldenEye went retail, the emulator and games were meant to be removed before release. 
However, everything has been left intact and on the cartridge, but it was made inaccessible with no way to run it, other than by patching the ROM itself. With most emulators, a ROM image must be provided to allow the kernel or OS to run successfully. The ZX Spectrum would require a ROM image, which would be the property of Amstrad, who owned all assets of the Sinclair brand name and the computer line, when in 1985, Sir Clive Sinclair sold the brand to Amstrad. This would mean that it would be impossible for Ellis to include the kernel ROM in the game cartridge for legal reasons. The solution, of course, would be to write his own kernel ROM from scratch. Fortunately, this would not be difficult. He would build his own with just enough function calls to get the games to work. So things like Serial I.O. and the Basic Interpreter would be discarded because they would not be required for the games to run. This minimal ROM replacement would be enough to not get rare in any kind of legal troubles with Amstrad. When GoldenEye was released, no one would be aware of the hidden emulator built into the game code because it was not accessible. However, GoldenEye has been subject to many, many years of investigation, hacking and reverse engineering to learn of its secrets. There were rumors about the emulator being hidden in the game for almost 15 years after the release of the game. And most people would dismiss it as being just a rumor. In 2012, a discovery was made by a user known as Spoon Diddly that the emulator was indeed real. GoldenEye has configuration entries pertaining to the game located at hexadecimal address 21990. This configuration also contains references to Sinclair's ZX Spectrum emulation. So how can we access the emulator itself within GoldenEye? Given that there is no entry point to access the emulator and its ROMs, a patch was created to enable the emulation support and access to the games. In order to trigger them, during the folder selection screen in GoldenEye, plugging in a control into port 3, pressing L and R and another button will launch the ROM. So for example, if we want to play Saberwolf, holding down L and R and pressing left on the yellow CD pad will launch into the game. Or if we want to launch into Jetpack, holding down L and R and then pressing up on the yellow D pad will launch into that game. From this menu, all 10 games can be launched with different button presses. The emulation itself, well, it's pretty damn good. Emulating a ZX Spectrum doesn't require a ton of resources, but it does have the correct color palette run at the correct timings and includes all the quirks of the Spectrum, including color banding and more. However, there doesn't seem to be any sound available in this emulation. Not a huge deal, because the ZX Spectrum was limited to basic sound effects and tones at best, but it would have been nice to round out the entire package. Pressing L on controller 1 during the emulator will return you back to the folder screen, and from here you can pick another ROM or just jump back into GoldenEye itself. For those that may be concerned that this patch invalidates the claim, Steve Ellis himself confirmed that the emulator was a thing and discusses some of the points about the kernel ROM workaround. And furthermore, if you take a look at the 007 GoldenEye recompilation project on GitHub, you can clearly see that there is ZX Spectrum emulation that was decompiled with the game itself. In conclusion, while technically Rare Replay wasn't the first time that Rare had dabbled with including a back catalogue of their games on physical media, it was never included officially as part of GoldenEye. Rather, it was something that was left behind, seemingly as a mistake that should have been removed from the final version of the game. But still, the ZX Spectrum emulation and the 10 games dating back to 1982 is just another fascinating insight into the development process of the GoldenEye development team themselves, and it would not be the last time where they would leave secrets in their games. There would be a hidden version of Jetpack, another classic Ultimate Play of the Game release in Donkey Kong 64. But this time around, it would not be a emulated version, rather, it was a natively compiled version of that game. So there you have it guys, that is the story of GoldenEye and how ZX Spectrum ROMs were found and an emulator was found inside of the ROM cartridge itself. It's a very interesting story to go back and revisit for you guys and I want to thank the people that brought it to my attention. I'm going to leave links and credits to everyone that was involved in this discovery in the comments below, so check those links out. And yeah, what else can I say? I mean, was it the original Rare Replay that was, you know, was done many years before Rare Replay? I guess in some ways you could say it was, but ultimately this was more of a proof of concept 
that Steve Ellis was working on to see if he could get ZX Spectrum games running on the Nintendo 64 via emulation. And as we've seen, he was very much able to do this without too much trouble. Well guys, we are going to leave it here for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, you know what to do. Leave me a thumbs up and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.